was just before lockdown. We're about to get locked down. We're about to all close. We need to carry on the, the wow. show. And, and it was really good for us to look at what we're really good at, but yeah. also, and more importantly, what we're really bad at and what our weaknesses were. I think every 16 to 18 year old in, in the country should do a, a month stint as a kitchen porter. I think they would learn so much. There's probably, there was about 10 different, 10, 12 different restaurant business plans that I wrote up full full decks on and I'd be so passionate about each one. Spent like about a year and a half like homing in on what exactly I wanted on that and it was and it became really clear that it it was croissants. You know, we want people to not only understand Popham's as 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 pastry, but can we be the you know, the place to come to just for amazing artisan food. Our eating habits are changing. We're demanding better dining experiences and the food market has never been so competitive. Starting and succeeding with a food business is challenging, but some determined and passionate entrepreneurs are flourishing. These people have big dreams, big passion and big drive. They are disruptors change makers and innovators. They see a positive future. Many say that food business is too risky. Some say that it has huge rewards. Are you up for the challenge? In today's episode, I sat down with Ollie Gold from Popham's Bakery and Restaurant here in London. Ollie is a true hospitality, passionate professional worked his way up from Kitchen Porter to now having two, three sites in London. Uh, super passionate about food, hospitality, restaurants, and just people, like pleasing people we spoke about so many times throughout the interview. And it's something that he clearly strives for, clearly drives him. And it's such an important part of the culture of his business and just such an important part of making it a success. Uh, tons of learnings in this interview. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I think we have a lot in common in terms of our journey, uh, certainly in terms of career and working our way up through the industry. And really great, passionate guy, and you just really wish him the best. Um, sit down, enjoy, um, and get a notepad to hand. Lots of learnings in this interview. Why don't we start with the pandemic and COVID? I think we feel obliged to do that. Yeah. Um, obviously, it's been an emotional roller coaster. It's just gone on so long at this stage. First of all, like, how are you kind of? How did you deal with it initially, mm -hmm. and how have you kind of got through this? Like, it's been eighteen months now or more, and it's still going. Yeah. Like, surely it's tough and just a mental challenge and physical probably as well. Yeah. Like, how I have mean, you dealt with that personally? Um, yeah, I mean, it's been tough, and I was actually on the uh, on the tube on the way over here. I was I was thinking of. Covid and, and the long period that it's been now and it's been it's yeah as you said like nearly 18 months um, and I was trying to split it up into you know how it's actually been for for myself and, and the company yeah. problems and it has been in like different stages along the way um, and it's been like I feel like it's been actually like a, a real battle but one that we've like definitely taken a lot of positives from as a company and we'll mm. go into that in a sec but I mean at the beginning I, like, I remember it really clearly it was it was terrifying like you know when everything was going on in the country and you had this news from Italy and the rest of the world etc and there was definitely a time I think it might have been like a couple of weeks before we went into the national lockdown where it was like oh my god this is something really bad is, mm. is happening and <clears throat> you know has all this work that we've all put into this company for three years is this all gonna like is it all gonna be a complete waste of time like you know we weren't aware of any support there was or any of that stuff hadn't been sure. uh, communicated to us so I, I i remember being really scared for for i don't know maybe it was a week 10 days um and then i think then there was a realization that um and it was just before the lockdown came um that we've got to act quickly because you know, we're thinking like this, a lot of other companies are going to be thinking like, you know, what are we going to have to do to keep the company moving forward? And, you know, at the forefront of that was, you know, staff. Mm. And it was how do we, um, what are the best decisions 
for the staff you know that that is you know that's our biggest responsibility and mm. you know before when you're running a business staff's a big responsibility and suddenly there was this huge added element of like oh my god there's this virus that you know it can kill people mm. um and so you know a lot of our all of our decision making was like you know with the staff at the forefront yeah um but also you know thinking about how the business is gonna go forward and and you know how we're gonna succeed so we actually had this um amazing meeting i remember it with with like the sort of senior management team, there's four of us, um, and we need to do deliveries and we need to do it quick. Like we're about to, it was just before lockdown, we're about to get locked down, we're about to all close, um, but um, we, need to, we need to carry on the, the wow. show. And, and we spoke to staff and, you know, we asked them, you know, how they felt and if they were comfortable, if it was a situation they were gonna come back to work. Are they comfortable coming back to work? And that was always, throughout the whole 18 months, that was always the conversation. Okay. Are you comfortable? If you're not comfortable coming to work, then, you know, please okay. don't. Um, and so, yeah, we created this sort of 50, 55 product delivery menu that I remember, I, yeah, we all did it together and then I put it down on one of those Google job forms and just, we put it on Instagram and then sent it out to all of our mail, our mail out and, it was crazy. It was literally suddenly like this crazy period happening where we we were doing 150, 160 deliveries a day. Wow. We were all there was about I think we kept there was like 12 of us in the team, um, and yeah, we were sort of coming in at 4 a.m. and packing over a thousand items wow. in the morning. And we was this straight after you did that, or did this it take was the time? day of lockdown? Wow. We did. We literally. I remember the day before. We actually did it the day before lockdown was our first day of deliveries, and then we went straight into it the next day. I like begged some and borrowed some vans off some friends that fortunately have an events company that obviously nothing was going ahead. So we suddenly had three vans on the road, and we were doing you know a huge amount of deliveries um, for a few months, which was great. It was a huge learning curve for us. You know, we'd never delivered. An item, as it was not something as a bakery we had done, we don't do any wholesale, we don't do any deliveries. Mm. And suddenly when we were forced into something, you know, we learn, mm. you know, with making a lot of mistakes on the way, like you can't just run this from a job form. So suddenly a, f a few weeks in, like we were looking at different systems that we could have online and sure. we started implementing them. Um, at the beginning it was super admin heavy, right? We were emailing, calling everyone for their payment the night before their delivery. And yeah. It was, yeah, it was too much, but um, huge. In terms of that menu, was it the menu from the, the bakery itself? Or yes. did you add to it? Or? So it was, I guess it was a, a, a slight, so all of our um, bakery items, so our pastries, we're really lucky and I'll be first to admit that like our, you know, pastries and coffee and pasta are super easily takeawayable items. So we had that on our side, we were really lucky. Sure. Like all the restaurants that, you know, more sort of fine dining restaurant or just, you know, sitting down, it's, it's a lot harder to create those mm. three course menus to, for people to have at home. Um, and then our pasta, um, our pasta team basically came up with a pasta menu that was, you know, slightly, um, but it was a lot easier than what we serve in the evening usually is, you know, everything's usually hand shaped in the evening, individual pieces. Now we were moving to noodle pastas, tagliatelle, etc. Um, so yeah, we had about five, six different pastas, about five, six different sauces, and then a huge range of um, pastries. We also got in touch with our cheese suppliers and we were selling their cheese that they had stock of, um, meat supplier as well. So yeah, huge range. Um, and that, it was, it was good fun. It was, it was really nice to, to give back to the community that had given us so much in the first few years. Mm. And, you know, it was so nice seeing them. We were still, all, all the people that were on the tills were still doing the deliveries. So seeing them on the doorstep the next day was really nice. And mm. uh, it was that, that tough time for people. It was nice to see that familiarity of, sure. of what we could give people, but also just that friendly face of, you know, we're still here, etc. Sure. Sure. Um, so then it was deliveries. And then uh, I think we reopened in sort of, uh, May, I think we decided to open our okay. coffee shops. A lot of coffee shops didn't close, uh, but I think they just carried on. We just wanted to, um, yeah, we didn't really feel it was right to create like a busy atmosphere inside our bakeries at that mm. time. <clears throat> and sort of just wanted to scope the landscape. Um, and then we reopened and yeah, it was really busy. It was, um, it was weird that it wasn't, it was, you know, one in, one out wasn't why you do hospitality, it was like quite a soulless atmosphere. Yeah, you know, yeah. it was very much, it felt really transactional, which wasn't 
um, you know, something that we feel really passionate about our problems is, is creating a community for people and mm. you know, that whole discussion in the morning and talking to people and, mm. and um, yeah, just being that friendly face to people and suddenly it was like in, out, you know, yeah, in, yeah. out. Um, and sure. yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the nicest like environment to, to be in, but as I said, yeah, it, it definitely got us through okay. um, that period, which was, yeah. Sounds good. Really Sounds positive. like you've taken the whole thing kind of in a positive frame of mind and proactive. And yeah. Kind of, I guess, thinking about the right people. So it's the staff number one yeah. and the, the safety of those, like the basic mm -hmm. safety and health of them, but then also the consumer as well. And yeah. trying to offer them a different way to get their food that maybe they're coming for every day or every week. Yeah. So it's kind of thinking of the right people first and then just facilitating that with the business I must. Exactly. I guess that's why, well, part of the reason why you've been quite successful with it. Yeah, I mean, it's, all, yeah, people are huge, huge to us at, at Poppins. It's something that we've, um, you know, we put a lot of time into um, and a lot of thought. Um, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say we've got the perfect environment. We do absolutely everything we can to do so. Um, and it's definitely COVID has made it harder for a variety of reasons um, mm. to do that. But yeah, it's, it's yeah, just going on the positivity side. Um, it's been, I'll look back on it, it has been a positive side of problems. It was, you know, when we started in 2017, in October, um, you know, it was a seven day um, operation. Uh, you know, it was, it was pretty full on for the first, you know, three years, what, two and a half years before COVID. And mm. I think when COVID hit, you know, we got over the first sort of month of deliveries. It was, it was the first time that we all sort of sat back and, and breathed in mm. a way. You know, when you, it was before we were sort of just getting through every week, right? And we were so involved in the company. You know, I was there, I'd be there every single day, you know, on the floor. And I just wanted to be part of it and do as much as I could for the company. And then, um, yeah, you took a step back and, you know, the bakery was closed and you know nothing could go wrong and there weren't yeah. any staff there there weren't any customers there and it was really good for us to you know look at what we're really good at but yeah. also and more importantly what we're really bad at and what our weaknesses were mm. stuff that you know just getting through week and week perhaps we were overlooking because we just needed to get through the week get mm. through the month um, and so we had these really open honest interesting conversations within <laughs> ourselves of like right yes this is this is bad this is no not not nice what's happened but you know let's let's improve for the future we you know we can better ourselves down the line and mm. like we made so many changes um internally that definitely i don't know what stage we'd be at now without them you know a year and a half down the line of just going through week on week i don't know how we'd be now and it's you know yeah. it's um yeah, it's been a huge it's learning fantastic. curve and positive learning curve yeah. for us. You've made the most of it by the sounds of it. Definitely. I definitely. think it's not often you get a chance to like really step outside the business. Yeah. In a sense, you were forced to because you had no yeah. business operating to an extent. Exactly. But definitely. It sounds like you made the most of it. Yeah. So, so where is the business now, like currently, where there's still COVID restrictions to some extent and the market's still opening up? Are you still doing the deliveries to the same extent or is that pulled back or have you reduced it to any extent? And how is kind of trade at the moment? Um, so we've stopped deliveries completely from uh, June the 1st, we stopped delivering, they were um, getting quieter and quieter and obviously people um, yeah, were coming out more and they had a lot more options to go to and so we decided rather than just doing a few deliveries a day um, to cut that operation completely. Um, where at now, um, yeah, both sites operate um, Tuesday to Sunday in the morning as a bakery. So we have one of the big moves was going seven days a week to six days a week. Um, and then, yeah, our restaurants are operating in both sites. We have a pasta restaurant in Hackney and we have a, um, like a small plates and wine bar in Islington restaurant, which we actually opened in the middle of COVID as well. Okay. Um, trade's going, it's going well. Um, we're really lucky that our sites are in residential areas. Um, so we've still got some people who obviously aren't going to the office. Um, and they're quite community places, so places are, where people can meet and sure. enjoy coffee and pastry. Um, but what's tough is is staffing. I'm sure we'll, we'll is what we were going to go yeah. into, and that yeah. that's sort of what the big yeah. fight is at the moment. Yeah. And that's that's sort of what we're doing. And, Absolutely. And um, yeah. Okay. I want to come back to the staffing thing. Okay, Obviously, cool. it's the biggest thing in the industry at the moment. Yeah. And I want to think of the future and see if you have any insights on that. But we'll come back to that. Cool. 
Uh, before we get to that, I'd love to yeah. go right back to the beginning. Okay. And even in your childhoods, like growing up in London. Yeah. Like I'd love to hear where your passion, your clear passion for food and hospitality. Yeah. But also your entrepreneurial mindset and mm. that kind of positive thinking um, ambition, I suppose, as well. Where all that came from, if you know. <laughs> yeah. Or, or kind of, um, I guess, your early days in food. You can tell us about that. Okay. Um, so growing up, I was really lucky to have um, a, a mum who was obsessed with cooking. Um, you know, we were trying new things every week, you know, and it, was, it wasn't the same plate of food that was in front of us every night. And it was just like really interesting for, for my brother and myself to be trying, you know, new produce so often. Um, and, and then, and I think I was discussing with you earlier, but growing up in an area like Shepherd's Bush, where it is, um, like the most eclectic group of people and it's this like almost cauldron of so many different cultures that were like on our doorstep you know we had the polish center opposite the opposite us you had the um you know the ethiopian ethiopian restaurants the caribbean restaurants and you know me and my friends and my brother we used to love just stepping out and and trying what was on our doorstep and and that growth that like intrigues your palate i guess and that you know, lets you have an understanding of so many different flavors. And um, I just, that obsession just came of like cooking and cooking and I would just stand next to my mum and help her cook. And, and, you know, that was something in my childhood that I like remember, I think most fondly out of anything. Um, and that links with my next thing is, is sport. And I've always played a lot of sport um, and you're where you touched on in ambition, I think, um, I was a very um, competitive person yeah. on the sports field. I was always like the, I played a lot of rugby and football. I was always the smallest person on the pitch. And I think I had this really like competitive edge to, you know, to try and mm. beat the rest. And, and I think when it comes to ambition, and that's my drive. I, I've never given up with, with anything. And, you know, um, I think I can see that from the, from the sports pitch. Sure. Um, and yeah, with, when there's the early days of opening a business, when there are plenty of times where you want to give up and you wonder why are you doing this, yeah. um, you know, sack it all in. Um, and it's that, I guess that sort of, I just won't ever give up doing anything I try. And so I think that's where, where that stems from. Yeah, I think the sports thing is, is mm. um, it kind of resonates with me. I have a similar really? kind of background as well yeah but also I see it in other entrepreneurs and I think it's almost like the little dopamine hit that you're kind of craving yeah so that kind of goal setting and then or maybe it's scoring a goal or yeah. getting a try or whatever it is but it's always constantly striving for that yeah and not giving up I suppose like that competitive streak as well as you say so I think it's quite interesting yeah definitely yeah very good um, great uh, so let's then um, talk about your early days in uh, hospitality yeah so you mentioned you started as a kitchen porter so yeah kind of starting at bottom up um, yeah and I know you worked in Formula One as well yeah which is kind of similar to your early days with that eclectic mix yeah You're now traveling around the world in different countries exactly. and different cuisines different people and cultures yeah um, tell us about your early career okay. and kind of on Formula One and how that kind yeah. of I guess benefited you now, I suppose, from what you do. Um, so I was in my first year of uni, I was 18, and um, I was studying sociology, and it was something that I knew that I wasn't going to pursue, I think. I, was, I loved being at university, um, meeting people, etc. And someone, just a friend from, um, from home, who was linked with uh, an events company, basically said, as a team um, in McLaren and Formula One, they need a kitchen porter this weekend. Um, and you know, you need to get down to London in the next two days if you want to do it. And you're going to go out to, I think Monaco was the first race, which was wow. <laughs> this crazy, crazy race. Um, and so I, I did it, I, I went down to London, I went to Monaco, I was suddenly in this kitchen, um, Formula One kitchen, which sounds, it's, yeah, it sounds really nice and, and plush and it's like, the hospitality side of Formula One is just couldn't be more different from you're the still front side. Pots. <laughs> you're washing pots, but you're also in this. You do everything in like a thirty-foot container um, behind all the paddock, and you know you're you're, you're stuck in the corner. Um, and I just when I walked when I worked in that first day I had in that kitchen, and this is no like exaggeration. I like I'm really true to it. I felt this like team camaraderie 
like so much and just and just love for for willing to help each other and I was so it was I had that on the on the team sports I had that on the rugby pitch on the football pitch but you know that was for me that was just like fun and that was sport and that was something I loved so much and then you get like I hadn't um you know you go into this career and you think about a career of what you want to do and you don't think a job could be so fun you know when I was 16 or 17 I had various admin roles which is sitting at computer which I just absolutely hated and I just knew that I could never sit at a computer um and so I got into this kitchen I was like oh my god I'm earning money here and I'm um, it's so hard but I'm loving it because the people around me are just amazing and you know we're all in it for each other but you know I was doing that first week it was you know we'd start at 4am and we would get back to the hotel at 1am and it was like the longest days and I, was, I remember every day just being absolutely shattered but on the way into the track in the morning I just I would love to I was so excited to be there again and I was like as I was saying the we had, um, we, we were, you feed the mechanics, you feed the engineers, but you also feed, you know, a lot of the VIPs who come and, you know, they would be sitting close by and you could see them. Um, and those early days, the first few days, it was that moment where you see, you know, I'd wash the pans and, and the crockery for the chefs and I was passing to them. Yes, I didn't create one bit of, of food that was on that plate, but I would see these customers enjoy this food and like talk about it and like smile with each other. And you know, they'd pop their head into the kitchen and be like, that was amazing guys. And I sort of was like, oh my God, I, I had a little part to play with that. Mm. Um, and then, um, so that year I sort of just, uh, I was lucky enough, I carried on with, with McLaren throughout the whole <coughs> of the summer. Um, just working in as a uh, kitchen porter. Again, it was like the hardest labour intensive job I've, I've ever done. Like we would be, sometime when there was a back to back race, you'd do two weeks in a row, sort of 17, 18 hour days. Um, but yeah, I, I loved it. And it was, you know, it was that moment of everything I grew up with, with food and loving food. I was like, right, this is, this is now why I need to do. I, I, I want to be a chef, that was my dream. Um, I need to be in the food industry um, and so for the next couple of years I went to uni but I was very much um, on call for, for when the guys needed me at work. Um, I did the next sort of two years as a kitchen porter still um, and yeah again just loved it but had the you know obviously the communication there with, with the chefs was like right I really want to start sort of learning how to how to cook um, properly in a restaurant environment so I guess then after that for a couple of years I was um, I guess like commie chef level um, and yeah that, that sort of brought it more and more on in 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 that sort of what we were talking about before of that instant gratitude that you see from the customer it was you know that I was think I was on salad buffet then so all the all the uh, the media they're so lucky they come in and they get this like incredible 30 plate media buffet and I was doing that with another guy and it was just you know again them coming in and saying thanks so much and it was that instant gratitude that I just really enjoyed and I thrived from and it would just want me to work harder and harder and, and you know better myself as much as possible mm. um, so yeah those those early days in Formula One they were like the you know the longest days and and you know I, I grafted a lot in those days but they're they're one they're the ones that I learned the most in and it's all about that you know teamwork and it's just like don't let that person down next to you um and yeah it was it was such an amazing environment for us to all thrive in yeah I, I resonate with that completely yeah. as well and we we're talking about it earlier the the instant gratitude and fulfillment mm. and I had similar experiences so I actually I was in Melbourne cooking for outside catering I was actually cooking for the queen Oh and I God. had this like tiny little part thing. I was, I don't know, it's like a fruit salad or something I was like part of. Yeah. But it's like, and it's not even somebody like that. It's anybody really, that if you're creating something, first of all, and then with your heart and soul and skill set and energy, mm. preparing something for somebody that pleases them and nourishes them. Yeah. And then in particular, if you get the feedback that it's like, wow, or yeah. that was really, I love that. It's just so gratifying. Yeah. And on the other side, I think as well as the, the energy of the team and you're all coming together, kind of tying into the sports as well. Yeah. Like you said, you're all coming together to, to achieve that mm -hmm. for other people. It's yeah. quite basic, I think, and quite yeah. probably human. Mm. So I think for me, and kind of 
tying into the, the staffing issue as well. I think both of us, it's the passion that we feel for the industry. Yeah. I guess the fulfillment and pleasure that we get from working in it. Yeah. Because you are pleasing other human beings essentially. Yeah. So, yeah. And that's the front side. And also I remember like at the end of the day when the head chef would, you know, and you're, you're mopping the floor at the end of the day and the head chef would like, you know, grab you around the shoulder and be like, smashed it today, Ollie. Like that, that is, feels good. As an 18, 19 year old as well, that, that's, that's a really nice feeling. And it's like, exactly. you've, you've made his life easier. Yeah. Like it's, it's, yeah, really both sides, customer, but also when you have that gratitude from your own team, yeah. it's really nice. Very good, very good. You really put in the work, like from a few years as kitchen porter, like you really, Yeah, I was there for a while, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah it was, I, I always say to, I think it should be like, I think every 16 to 18 year old in, in the country should do a, a month stint as a kitchen porter. I think they would learn so much. And also when we talk about staffing later, it also might just tempt some people to go into the industry that <laughs> yeah. doesn't ever get talked about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then if you just want me to go, so after that, basically I, yeah. so when I left uni and I had to decide what my sort of full full time job was, um, I, yeah, I think I was a chef for sort of the first year and a half of that. And then um, I had this opportunity to sort of move into the more logistics and operations role of hospitality. So it was crazy. We would send, you know, there was 21 races a year and we would send around everything from a knife, a fork to a glass, but every oven, double door fridge, everything had to be the same in every race, all wow. the equipment we use. So I moved into that side of, um, you know, we'd send everything around the world in, in Europe and outside of Europe and then I'd go there and set the kitchens up. Um, but then also my role was um, in charge of the food and drink suppliers. So working locally um, in all the countries with the food and drink suppliers and that side of it I absolutely loved um, because, you know, we'd be in the middle of China and Nico Rosberg needs his gluten-free oats and you know I loved that task of having to find gluten-free oats in the middle of China and, and in Shanghai and you know speaking to so many different people to lead me to this path but um, yeah but on, on a larger scale just feeding the whole team um, from local suppliers and that led me to like loving produce Sure. and seeing how produce differs from each country, which is just, is massive. Like yeah. it's every time you'd, you'd order something uh, and seeing how, you know, it was in Italy compared to Malaysia and et cetera. It was just, it was, for me, it opened my eyes so much. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, Very I guess, yeah. yeah. And how, like, I guess, where's your entrepreneurial spirit or where did that develop or come from, do you think? And also the business sense and the business ambition. Um, so my desire to um, start my own business, I think, you know, I'd say it sounds weird, but it was on, it was on aeroplane journeys. I basically, I knew that I wanted to run my own business. I just wanted to have that impact on other people. And I wanted that to be, I guess, um, you know, I, I thought I knew a good way of how, you know, how to make people happy and, and I wanted, you know, to see as many people happy as possible. And if I can lead that, you know, that was something that I always dreamt of. Um, and I used to spend so many journeys just writing business plans. And I have, you know, there's probably, there was about 10 different, 10, 12 different restaurant business plans that I wrote up full, full decks on. And I'd be so passionate about each one. And they were all, the early ones were just, I was too young to, sure. to do it and take it to the next level. Um, but I always thought that one, like I was, it was a cauliflower pizza restaurant. And I was like, okay. this one, it's, it's, it's the health kick. People, this is this is going to be this the one. It. And then I spent about a month trying to make the perfect cauliflower pizza, and just realised it was like the most labour intensive wow. thing ever. So I was like, no. Was then, this a cauliflower base or cauliflower base? Yeah. Wow. Um, and then then it was yeah. And then there was like various chicken shops that I wanted to do, um, but there, then. Uh, when it came to baking, like I always loved pastries and there was this place called Sutherland's, a really random place that was by me in Shepherd's Bush and it was just like every Sunday morning I got a pan of chocolate from there and I remember just loving it so much. Um, and I'd have, in London there was just no, I couldn't understand it, like London is was and is and maybe still now like the most forward thinking innovative creative food scene in the world mm. and everything was there and in pastry you if you went to a bakery it was only plain croissants only pan and chocolates and only almond croissants 
and I couldn't, I couldn't get my head around it. And I was like, we've got to do something about this. Mm. Uh, we, there's, you know, people try everything with so many different products and there's this amazing French traditional pastry that for me is like criminally underused because it's crispy, it's buttery. And if you put that with so many different flavors, you just get this like, you know, it's amazing. What more can you want than those, that, that base? Yeah. Um, so I spent, I'd say that was like my, I spent like about a year and a half, like homing in on what exactly I wanted on that. And it was, and it became really clear that it, it was croissants. Um, and that was like the only focus I was like, we have a plain croissant and we're going to use that same recipe, that same dough. And we just need to be innovative and creative and create as many different types of shapes, sizes with that one dough. But re I, I felt really, there was a time where I felt really strongly about just focusing on one product and one product only. Um, and then I was lucky enough through the traveling to visit places like Melbourne, um, which, you know, I would love just walking around in their cafe culture and their, you know, they had some great bakeries there at the time as well. Um, and I just, yeah, fell inspired. And then there was this, there was this one moment where I got back to London. Well, I was in London and I had to go to a race and I was just, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to go to Heathrow. This, this, I, I need to do this and I need to do it. And it suddenly became from like writing these business plans. There's, I don't know what happened. And you ask about where the entrepreneurial business, I, I don't know what it was exactly, but something was suddenly like, you, you need to do this. Sure. And I think just talking about it now, maybe some of it was because I spoke about it and wrote these plans. I think there was a stage where it was like, stop talking about it, Ollie. Mm. Now you've got to do it. And now, and now, and now challenge yourself. And, and it was that competitive instinct that came out. It was like, just do it. And now, you, now you've got to succeed and you've yeah. got to do it. Okay, very good. So you launched Popham's in 2017. Yeah. 2017. Um, I believe it was a pharmacy before you took it over. Yeah. How did you go about kind of launching, I suppose? Um, and how did you get it open? And I guess talk about the site and so on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a storage room for a pharmacy. Okay. And I guess we were led there because I would go, I would meet estate agents, I would go online and I'd look at these prices on near the high street and I'd look at the rent, so I'd look at the rates, and I'd do like my basic, how many coffees am I gonna sell, how many pastries, and I was like, that doesn't work. That, that math doesn't work. There's no, how, how what am I getting like, well, I can't afford anyway. We didn't have like, this was from my savings and like close family, small, small savings that we set up problems with. Um, and, you know, I'd sit in other coffee shops, and I would sort of sit there all morning and, you know, watch how many coffees and pastries they'd sell. But I'd also have a good idea of what their rent was. And I was, I was like, that's not matching up. What's happening here? Um, so I started getting scared about, is this actually realistic? Mm. Like, I'm, I'm not going to go into this. I don't have, I don't have the money to go into this as a, as a pastime or a joy. This isn't something for me to learn. Like, I need to go into this because this is, this is how I need to succeed and this is how I need to make a career of it. Um, and then, so then it then it, I guess it came back a bit and it was, um, it became clear that we need to create a destination because we can only afford a small site off the beaten track. And they, they were the only places that had rents that we could afford. And you know, that, that site in Islington, it's, uh, you know, sort of five minutes off Essex Road, which is, you know, you've got Upper Street, then you've got Essex Road and then, and us and it was sort of in the, in the middle of nowhere at the time, I guess. And um, yeah, came across that site. It was a very affordable rent. Um, but that then, then yeah, as I said, the destination, we're like, we have to, and that's where the one product thing then brewed and brewed. It's like, we need to make one product and we need to perfect that one product because we need to make people talk about one product. Mm. We can't try and perfect 10 products here because we don't really have the time. We don't really have like the resource to, to do that. Um, and, and then we, yeah, we got in there um, and we watched a lot of YouTube on how to build sites and we, myself and um, a guy Fraser who was the head barista at the time and my girlfriend Lucy um, who was always, you know, ran all the design and the look side and the feel side. Um, yeah, we gutted the place out 
and yeah, watch a lot of YouTube, how to tile, <laughs> how to plaster, how to do this. How, and we spent like five months, I think, just us three and you know yeah we did get some electricians in for the important stuff and plumbers in for the important stuff but sure. we had this site that we just we created our ourselves and yeah. and it was like it was such a, a labor of love of like coming in every day and just finding a new prop like a new part that we had to work on and um you know this this tiled wall was like the most at that time was like the proudest thing i've ever done in my life i was like oh my wow. god Fraser and I just tiled this wall. It was incredible. Yeah. So it's almost the same feeling as again creating the food for somebody. You're yeah. Now designing a space for somebody. Yeah, That's but no one was appreciating at the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then and people would walk past us and be like, "What are you doing? <laughs> There's no one around here." Like, yeah. what, look at like, those tiles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they didn't even see the tiles. Um, and there was a lot. Of those early days were hard because there, there was some. I don't know what it was. There were some people around there who were like. You know, there's, there's there's no one here. You know, don't do the like not don't do this, but like you know, are you sure you want to risk what you're doing here? Mm. Um, and like that, those <coughs> like uh, like early days where then you sort of when there's nothing there and there's nothing tangible, then you do question yourself because you've got nothing to prove. Like, mm. and you know, I didn't have any background in running a business before. I didn't have any background in bakeries before. Mm. I'd worked in a coffee shop for about six to eight months in Islington before, just so I got the idea of. Um, how, to, how, how a place really functioned daily. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, I think five months later, we opened, um, yeah, October 2017. Okay. To this very fresh, like, underfurnished. Un when, I look, when we look back at pictures now, we actually can't believe it looked like that. Yeah, the yeah. customers walked in. And it was a, not like, we were super proud of how it like, looked. Like, we really focus on atmosphere and how you, I always, I always thought when the food and drink in a place, yes, that needs to be top, top quality. And that's what we focus on. But <coughs> service and atmosphere is one of those things that you just can't and shouldn't compromise mm. one like second on. So you've got to feel comfortable when you're eating that food. And if someone, you know, loves, likes your food, doesn't absolutely love it, if they're sitting down and they're comfortable with a friend, comfortable mm. with their family and they're enjoying the atmosphere, then they're gonna come back. If, if they like the food, but they don't love it, mm. love the atmosphere, then they won't come back again. It's mm. those people feel comfortable in what they enjoy doing. Absolutely. I always say as well, in particular for a startup, it's so important to focus on the right thing at the right time. Yeah. And in particular, yeah. if you don't have the funding, which most people don't yeah. personally, you either go out and you get investment, but you give away a lot of equity and control and value yeah. and so on. But if you don't have that, so this, the, the normal, usual kind of entrepreneurial startup journey in restaurants, you really have to be super, super focused and control every penny. Yeah. I think it's really credible what you've done where you haven't spent it on a fit out, which isn't the most important thing for the startup. Yeah. It's more about the food, the experience, yeah. the, the vibe, the energy and so on. Mm, exactly. um, and you just made it happen, you got it open, kept yeah. your equity, yeah. but um, focus on the right things really. Yeah. Focus your resources, which is not just money, it's energy, time, yeah, um, and everything that goes with that. So it's, yeah. yeah, makes sense. Awesome. Very good, very good. Yeah. And just on the design then, to go back to that for a second, uh, did Lucy or you guys have like a design vision or did you like benchmark against others or do research or was it just this looks good? <laughs> it, <laughs> was, like this like, it was that thing of just creating a comfortable atmosphere and how do we do it? And like, I'm not gonna take a lot of credit for the design. Lucy's like, she's got an incredible eye. She always has done and she, it, and it was no like, wasn't even mapping out what it was look like. It was like, right, we need to order a floor now. What should the floor look like? Now we need to order this. What should that look like? And wow. then, and it came together as a site that did. Yeah, it looked it looked awesome at the time, and and yeah, it was just bit by bit. There was no sort of real overthinking sure. to it. Or, yeah, it was just, just sort of off the bat. Yeah. 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 Okay. Very good. So then, the early days you mentioned took a little bit of time. I guess due mainly to the location where you were. Yeah. Um, how were those early days and for yourself as well mentally yeah. and thinking about the survival of the business and what um, challenges specifically did you have to overcome at that stage so the early days um, so I'm just gonna quickly touch on um, so we just before we about a month before we opened I was interviewing lots of head bakers um, 
and uh, met this amazing guy, Florin, um, who within like, I remember it so well, but within like 10 seconds, I think I'd met like eight or 10 people before. I'd interviewed a lot of people. And within like 10, 15 seconds, I was like, oh my God, this is the guy, this is the guy that is gonna lead the baking side of it. Um, and I remember just praying and praying that on this little trial that we did, that he was a you know really good baker. And yeah, he turned out to be like an absolute genius and you know someone who I'm still very close to this day. He's not with Popham's now, but we stay in touch regularly. And, and he was, you know, so so important at that first drive of, of, of when we were when we were opening and um, yeah, without him, again, I don't know where we'd be today. Um, but those those first, I don't really know what period to put it in. Um, yeah, they were they were really hard. Um, I think I'll be the first to admit that you know I went into it after being able to do such long hours at my previous job which was just constant and constant and you know big big shifts I was like nothing's gonna make me tired here you know I've got all this energy I've you know I can work these long hours like people used to be like you know it's it's you know, you're gonna have to work really hard running your own business and I was like it's fine I've done that I've done those long hours and then like even just a few weeks in I remember being like okay it's not the physical you know, hours that people talk about, it's the mental side. Mm. And that is something that I'll be, yeah, straight up admit, <laughs> completely underestimated. You know, previous jobs, when you finish your work, you might go home or you might go for a beer with friends, family, you might go home, sit down, watch the TV. Suddenly that's like eliminated and you go home and like, my brain, I remember, was just moving at like a horrendous pace, just thinking over, and probably overthinking so many things and just worrying, you know, just, is this going to be, you know, worrying about staff, product, just every side of it. Um, and I did, I did find that hard. Mm. Um, and there, I, like, there were days where I remember I'd finish cleaning up and then you'd, I'd sit down on the floor being like, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> I don't need to, like, what am I doing here? Yeah. This is really tough. Um, and, but then, you know, on the other side of that, we were growing at a small steady rate then in the first few months where people were loving what we were producing and that was keeping me going. Mm. And you know that, you know, going back to what we were saying earlier, but people were really enjoying it um, and, and you know, loving the sort of small place that we had created in Islington and, and community for us from, from day one has been the biggest focus and that is bringing people together from all parts of Islington um, and, and seeing people who had come in separately as individuals in those early days and then they were meeting up and meeting each other and I was like, that's so cool. People mm. are like, we've created a place that people are now coming to see each other from. And I, mm. I, was, I was, little bits like that, you know, that just get yeah. you up in the morning. It's like- It's almost the same thing again, isn't it? It's pleasing other people. Yeah. And it's kind of a different level then. It's not just through the food, which is obviously very yeah. important, but it's through interaction and connection as well. Yeah. And that, that's like, that just goes back to hospitality and why, like hospitality and why everyone does it or, you know, mm. definitely more on the front of house side, but it's that, it's that connection and it's that, you know, you're talking to a new person every day and it's like, how cool is that? How cool is that for like your own horizons and, and your mind? And it's, it's so important. So seeing that on the front line every day, like I'll just get the buzz off and like, I don't think I left that till for, about six, six, twelve 12 months, like yeah. I was just there every day and I just, I loved it. Yeah. I, lo I loved talking to people and like, so like, f you know, we had bakers in the back and floor and leading this amazing pastry movement. And, and I was, there was, I had so much energy to talk about the pastries because I knew what he was doing back there. And, sure. you know, I just loved talking to the customers about what we were creating. Sure. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. Great. So I want to touch on uh, social media and mm -hmm. the importance of that and in particularly the early days as yeah. a few years ago now but still obviously social media was quite prominent yeah uh, how important was that in building up the trade levels and just getting out there and getting the name out there um massively hugely i mean again i was it's something we completely underestimated um the power of instagram mm. and you know our, our basic concept of creating an innovative pastry in an atmospheric environment and then alongside these um, ceramics and you know we really wanted 
you know, from day one, we used um, beautiful ceramics from a local artist um, who I knew called Jess Joss, and, and suddenly you, you create this nice pastry on this plate and and people were taking people were taking photos and and it was the yeah the the way that sorry the way that people use instagram i guess we just weren't aware of like people we have these wood we had these wooden tables in the window and people would queue up to to sit there wow. so that they could take the picture of the pastry on the plate on this wood because they wow. wanted that shot and we were just we were like you've got a warm bacon and maple there just eat it <laughs> don't take a photo of it just eat exactly. it um but the social media side again driven by lucy my girlfriend um she yeah it was all it's all just it was all organic like we um we just felt that was that was the way to go is is let people you create something nice and let people do the movement on Instagram, let people talk about it, because that's how you grow, rather than like, you know, us focusing on like, I don't know, big social media giveaways, or I don't know, different marketing platforms. We've never had a marketing plan, we've never used a PR company, it's always just like, what feels right now, mm. let's take a photo of this product now and put it online. Um, we're like big, we don't ever post too much because we don't want to give people you know too much online um and i think there's like you know there's so much on instagram i think you just got to be careful of, of how much you use it and how much you know you post towards people but it was that it was just letting people focus on what they want to do which is take photos of your pastries and then word will get around and and then we got lucky that you know if people with bigger um followings you know they found about popums and they came and we you know, we never knew who they were. Um, and then we just grew like a, I guess, a, um, a good relationship with them. They really enjoyed Popham's and um, yeah, we had a few big posts basically that then sort of took it to the next level and then we got more and more followers. What um, were those posts? Pardon? What, what were the posts? That like Felicity Spectre okay. did, um, she, she was like super supportive from quite early on. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, well, then it just organically grew the account and um, okay. yeah. It's, Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And do you, um, or are you continuing to kind of develop the concept and the menu and even the, the design? Uh, to facilitate that on Instagram? Is it that deep or? No, and no, that's okay. not, I didn't want it to come across earlier as like yeah. we created something for Instagram because that was so accidental. And I like really, it was like everything that we talked about in our meetings or in our tastings was always quality focus and how it would taste. We'd never be like, why don't we top that with pink? Because pink gets the most likes. Like that sure. was never ever. And it is frustrating because sometimes we have these write-ups that are like insta focus popums mm. and we're, they're like no it's not please yeah. <laughs> we want to be quality focused yeah. um but uh so no it doesn't we don't focus no menu concept is based around instagram and i think that's really important for organically growing because people feel really understand of who you are like i think the reason of the success of our instagram is because lucy is at the company every day she understands the company truly and like exactly what we're about and it's not you know when I see some PR companies doing posts for people it, it's great but something it's not like as like authentic and it might not come across exactly of who you are and that's mm. what that's what your social media account should be it should be a true account and a true idea of who you are you mm. know not just to get the post to get the likes to get engagement um so that that's where it really stems from is like Lucy's sort of depth and knowledge of yeah, it's what real. we are really and it's yeah. so real yeah makes sense makes sense so off the back of the success of that first site then yeah. you obviously launched in hackney in london fields yeah in 2019 yeah um i know that was significantly bigger it was five times the size yeah. of your first yeah. one how did that come about and i guess again the challenges of something so much bigger and uh, more substantial in so many different ways and yeah. then i guess you have to continue to prove yourself, I suppose, and yeah. to maintain the level of standards in all senses of the word. Yeah. So how, how did that come about? Um, there's a lot of good questions in there. Um, so it was getting really busy, our site in Islington. Um, and, you know, honestly, from 
from the outset and why we set up problems, it was never, I never had this dream to go big. Like it just, I wanted to be, and I said, we wanted to be the best in London and not the biggest in London. And I just had this like dream of, you know, people from different countries knowing Popham's for the quality of Popham's. It was never like, oh my God, Popham's have 10 sites. I never want that. It was like, how can we be the best from, you know, the small surroundings we have? Um, but it was getting busy um, and we wanted to, you know, create another space. Uh, and firstly, why Hackney? I mean, I, I used to cycle past this. I live in Homerton. I used to cycle to Islington every morning and I used to go past these three, Lardo, Patty and Bun, and it was a restaurant raw duck at the time. Um, and we just loved this on the side of London Fields. And when we were looking for a new site, we were looking at other places and nothing just, nothing seemed right out there. And um, again, it was like crazy rent prices. Um, you know, I really didn't want to overdo all the, uh, this hard work that we had done in the first sort of year and a half. Um, and then we found out that there was this site that was going to come available in London Fields um, and we jumped at it and we were so excited about it. Um, and, and then I guess, so moving on to the operation we had to have there, yeah, it was so much bigger. It was so much scarier. These rent numbers were so much bigger and everything. And I was like, okay, calm down. Like, we, we, we're going to do this and we're going to smash this. Um, but we can't just run it. We can't just close at four o'clock. We can't just be a bakery. We, we need to operate longer than this for us to maintain these sort of rent prices and to, to make money. Um, and so then this sort of the pasta restaurant idea stemmed and we have this so this guy Phil King who's now our exec chef and looks over everything food wise uh, in the company he was a baker at the time he was also doing lots of pasta supper clubs on the time at the time um, again like absolute wizard with his craft like what he does with dough pasta dough is just absolutely exceptional um, and so we had this bigger site um, and I also loved the, when we were thinking about what other option we did in the evening we're not going to do pizza. There's a pizza restaurant two doors down and there's a lot of pizza in, in, in Hackney in East London and in London. Um, pasta, if we do pasta, it's really similar skill sets to, to pastry and bread. And you're, you know, you're mixing the dough, you're shaping the dough. And it was really, uh, yeah, really similar. And we have this big shaping table in our site in Hackney that if you're sitting on the bar, if you come in the morning, you see the, the uh, pastries being shaped then you see the bread being shaped and then you see the pasta being shaped and you know it's, it's everything there in front of you um, so that's where the idea of pasta stemmed from and that's why we sort of we started a pasta restaurant there um, and then just sorry answering your other questions the difficulties of moving from one to two sites um, so uh, I thought one site going from zero to one site was really hard and it, it was uh, we, I was explaining about that earlier, I found that really tough. Um, but then there was a whole new level of like one to two. Mm. And again, someone who's not done it before, I wasn't really aware of them. And this was something we were learning on the way. And it was that, it was the whole thing of, I was there in our site in Islington and we had our 12, 11, 12 staff there and everything was around four walls and I love being there and you know, the team was around me, you're in control yeah. and you have, and suddenly you realize, oh my God, I can't be in two places at once. And that's not like, the business doesn't revolve around me at all and it really doesn't. It's, it's about like our amazing team that we, that we have there. And, and that was, I guess, more so at that stage where it became really evident that you know, we had an amazing head baker. Um, you know, we had an amazing head chef at that time. Our head of coffee, you know, Lucy, who had run all the um, creative social side. And I needed to be more of a, you know, facilitator in this and let these people, you know, work their magic and, and, and let them create what we need to do at Popham's. But it was, it was hard, like you create a culture in one place and when you're there it's easy to create a culture right mm. when you have two places it's two that cultures it's two cultures mm. and that is and I have regrets about how we did it and I, I, I wish we did things differently in that movement from one to two mm. um, but it was yeah how, how do you keep two teams really happy in what they're doing and, and working well and, and keeping the, the quality 
top top but also understanding the Popham culture and mm. our service and what we're about mm. um, and that took that took a lot of work mm. um, and that was that was hard moving from one to two and, and not having that control over what was going on the whole time mm. um, so but, how did you I guess develop the culture or instill it or refine it to make it consistent so it's incredibly difficult yeah and it's something we're still doing yeah. and discussing most weeks now yeah. um, but it was it's creating a really strong and trustworthy management team in each department mm. who really understand what we're about and that's you know that's how you can you know it's impossible to say we've got 45 members of staff now this is how we want you to be yep. yeah you can do as many sort of little trainings and and bring people together but that's hard yep. so we need to focus on one two three four people who are your managers who are going to lead that site who really understand you and they have the time in the day to lead that culture so it was building that really strong management team um which now i'm so like we have just such an amazing management team at the moment and it's something that i'm so happy and so blessed with and it's sort of what hopefully fingers crossed is going to take us you know um keep going through through the next sort of six to 12 months um but yeah it's how makes do you sense. create a co culture there's there's makes sense so many different ways yeah. um and it is difficult but yeah. it's yeah really yeah. understanding what you're about yeah i agree i think it, it comes from the top down from yeah uh, the most kind of impactful way anyway it comes from the top down i think people do what people see not what they're yeah. told so i think it's more natural and even if you tell a manager to act a certain way their natural personality and values will come yeah. through eventually so i completely agree i think it's the best way having the senior people who are aligned yeah. in terms of the value and then naturally it'll start to kind of filter it through yeah. and filter down from directors as well i think yeah and that's yeah. why i still do i still work on the till like not okay. only do i love it and i and i you know i've got so many friends almost and customers at our sites but yeah it's it's i think it's important for staff to you know that service on the till and mm. what we're about and like creating the friendliest most loving service yeah. that's important for people around you to see and, and sure. see and understand and seeing yeah. it firsthand is is really yeah. important very good i want to just flip back to the addition of the pasta yes which is obviously quite unusual yeah um i guess becoming more common now and pasta is obviously uh, bit of a trend at the moment yeah um and it makes sense how it came about yeah. i think it's completely logical actually yeah uh, and it's obviously working yeah um but because it was unusual maybe f we were one of the first operators if not the first operator to do that yeah. to have bakery slash pasta how did you i guess brand it in one sense but just kind of the messaging around that and communication just to make it clear to people that you are a bakery and pasta, yeah. not either or, if that makes yeah, sense. And, yeah, and that is, that's something that's been, um, I guess, testing at times. Mm. Um, but it was, going back to that, and like bakery, pasta, and it was strange, we were, we were worried. Like we, we were, you know, we'd worked so hard to be known as the pastry guys in London and the ones who are creating innovative, creative pastries and you know we worked so hard for that and then what we kept talking to each other about was we don't want people to be like okay they they think they can do pastry now they're going to open a pasta restaurant and they're going to you know because they can do pastry they can now do pasta and we were so aware of that mm. and it made us want to fight harder and harder to to, to make that succeed but what you know it it's still what was really important in terms of like the messaging and why uh, pastries as I said basic pastry let's be more creative and innovative but that is what we've done in our pasta restaurant if we've res respected traditional Italian techniques and their shapes but let's just be a bit different let's mm. just be let's just sort of create our twist on um, on the menu and, and you know respect those traditions but you know we'll do it sort of the Popham's way um, and that and then going around to the all round brand it's you know, we want people to not only understand Popham's as 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 pastry, but can we be the you know the place to come to just for amazing artisan food? 
you know, hand-shaped food, artisan food that could lead us down the line to exploring other avenues and we don't just have to be pastries. I realised from an early day that even if we wanted to grow to a few sites, that's going to be tricky just by the pastries we do because of the quality that we do them at and you know the process that how we make the pastries there's no way you can have six pastry shops at that quality mm. in london mm. it's it's impossible mm. so it's you know it was building that brand of now we want to be you know the place to come to for the best artisan food okay um and that sort of going further that links to um it's popham's home Mm. that we've actually launched in the middle of COVID. So Lucy launched that. Um, and that is, you know, local artisan ceramics. And we have other items in there as well. But it was just another sort of edge to our sword on on um, on that side of things where we just wanted to, yeah, we're just trying to create a brand that people know us as, as that really. Okay, makes sense. And where do you see the growth so you've obviously added on some different streams uh, yeah particularly during covid you were forced to, yeah but where do you see then the future uh, i guess the brand is it more kind of lifestyle or kind of just good quality ingredients and homewares and things like that or i think yeah. it's i think it's that it's, okay. it's good quality handcrafted food drink and lifestyle okay and that doesn't mean like you know, we still want people to associate themselves with coming to us for pastries. And I think we still hold on to that. Yep. Um, but we just, yeah, having these different elements is just going to just allow us to be, you know, a bit more fluid going down the line. Okay, makes sense. And I guess with all these different streams now, different elements of the business to manage, like from a business level, but then operationally as well, and on the, the marketing or social media side. Yeah. How has your role changed? And you mentioned it a little bit that you're still involved and you are yeah. kind of pulling back and respecting other people's roles. But obviously there's a lot going on in the business now. Yeah. How have you consciously, uh, I guess, refined your role or developed your own personal role? Um, so yeah, there's a lot going on with it's, uh, how have I refined my personal role? Um, I, get, I guess it's just that it's, I want to lead this company in a way that I facilitate the best people out there leading each department and, and that's my direction, our direction of where we're going to go, um, you know, sorry, the direction of, um, you know, how we want Popham's and, you know, that's with you know, men menu development and making sure that, you know, everything's still in the parameters that we want at Popham's and, you know, making sure, um, Sorry, I'm actually going to answer this again. Is that all That's right? That's all right, yeah, of course. I, know, I was losing my it. train of thought That's there. That's right. Um, so I guess how has your role adopted or how have you adopted to the growing business and the different streams that have developed? Yeah, um, so yeah, I guess since COVID and when I've sort of stepped out a little bit from working on the floor so much, um, it's just um, managing an amazing group of managers and, and senior people who um, follow the direction of Popham's and understand exactly what we're about what we want and how that can be um, you know influenced on on our staff around the company and making sure that everyone understands the culture and yep. what we're about um, but then it's going forward you know a lot of what I think about is going forward as as a company so we've just finished this week early next week building a new production unit so I've been working on that for the last few months and um, yeah that gives us uh, ability to grow in different ways and so it's now you know i'm looking a lot at the next steps of popham's and and how we can you know flourish in the future but also like really making sure that we don't move too quickly and making sure that we need to stabilize what's going on now which has been really tough to do at the moment and you know i feel sure. like i'm more of a recruiter at the moment okay exactly. well <laughs> perfect segue let's let's get into that yeah so that's obviously how long have we got <laughs> Um, I hear so many different figures, like I think the latest was 200,000 shorts in the UK. Yeah. Um, but it's not just hospitality, it's the like HGV drivers and different areas of the sector. Yeah. And in the UK there's obviously Brexit, there's Covid, there's different sectors like the tech sector where there's probably better pay, probably better working conditions, maybe potentially better growth opportunities. Yeah. Um, so I guess, how is it for you at the moment? <clears throat> you're obviously, I think you're focusing on the right thing. 
personally with the culture and mm -hmm. really people first. Um, so to attract people into that culture, I think is a bit easier if you have that, yeah. but also to keep them, which is obviously so critical at the moment. Um, but yeah, that yeah. was your thoughts about um, in, in general. As it okay, I'm just trying to think where to start. Um, yeah. So I get only realized, so we went through the whole COVID, um, actually made like a couple of incredible hires in the middle of COVID and was super excited about it. We hired this senior operations manager who oversees sort of the day-to-day -day operations of the site who we got in like April, uh, June 2020 um, and you know she's absolutely incredible for the company and like really helping us moving forward and we're getting really excited about the team and the staff we had and you know ready to sort of open everything in April so we had the lockdown in January this year April and we were starting to recruit in February and March ready to open and it was it was just a bit slower than normal and I don't think we'd really like thought about a crisis that was there mm -hmm. um, but you know just little things we put out as a, a job for a CDP in our pasta restaurant where previously we might have got you know I don't know, 100 sort of applicants um, and we were getting like four five six wow. and the quality of them was was lower than what we'd usually get mm. and you know this day of opening was slowly slowly coming and and we were starting to get worried and then I think there was a realization quite quickly it was like okay there's something has gone on in the industry and there is just not the numbers that there were and then as you discussed it's I think it's just crazy mix of Brexit Covid yeah. um change of career I think a lot of chefs they sort of they went on furlough and they were like, this is what it's like to spend time with my family. This yeah. is what it's like to have a normal life. And mm. and they went and did that. And I think, yeah, you feel like, I know that Amazon in the north of England, they're struggling so much with basically these huge warehouses that Amazon have built, have like taken hundreds of chefs and paid them chef salary or more and working nine to five. And yeah. so, yeah, we're really short at the moment. How are we dealing with it? Um, it's gone it's yeah it's gone through different stages um we are on every recruitment i'd never even thought about using a recruiter before we were with every recruitment agency in london right. um we've got adverts out on on as many sort of advertising boards as you can um you know we've got bonuses for staff if they if they find help us recruit refer yeah. um but the, the numbers are just still, they're, they're just, they're not coming in. Mm. Um, and, you know, that time in April when suddenly all these customers were allowed to eat again, I, we were crazy busy as, as, as everyone was. And mm. we were work like, we, we had just about many people to, to you know, uh, keep going. But, you know, they were working more hours than, than we were like, you know. Mm. And we weren't, it's not something that we were, happy with we were you know we really wanted to get more people on board um but again they just there was we just couldn't we we're just really struggling to recruit mm. um and it's, yeah it's you can offer more money which we've had to do um but then going back to your retaining staff mm. you know it's everyone else wants staff so your staff are at peril mm. you know they can they can you know We've we've lost a few members of the team who They've have been, been offered insane jobs at uh, amazing restaurants around London, and you know they come to us like we've been, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity, and I'm sitting there absolutely gutted and devastated. They're leaving mm. in the back of my head. I'm like, I, you know, that, that is sense. a dream restaurant. Yeah. And a year ago, I'm not. Uh, I'm sure they would uh, do well getting the job, but they probably wouldn't have got the job a year ago. Yeah. And it's, so it's, it's really, you know, bringing people in is tough, mm. but what is really hard is retaining people. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's one way of doing that and you increase your, increase your costs. Mm. Um, but then what do you have to do? You know, it's, it's that impact on, on the customer. Um, mm. And, you know, it's, it's a big conversation we're going through at the moment is, mm. is increasing our prices. And um, it's something that we have to do mm. and that we're about to do. Um, but, you know, I'm still wary of, you know, a pastry has gone from £3.50 to £3.94. Mm. Does the customer know that there's a crisis in the industry? Mm. No. Mm. 
Like, what do they, you know, they just probably think, oh, they're sure. profiteering or something ridiculous like that. I don't know. Sure. And, and you risk that, like, you know, in hospitality, there's such fine margins everywhere and there's a mm. balance everywhere. Mm. Um, and, yeah, so it's really tough on that yeah. side. And then just going back to the staffing, it's obviously not only is all this happening, but you've got potential of COVID still. Mm. And you've got this pandemic or whatever they're calling it. And... Um, you know, it's people aren't at work and we're already running on a skeleton team and then you have someone who's yeah. messaged us the night before and says, I'm sorry, I can't come to work. I've I've been uh, been told to isolate. Yeah. And then, you know, we've got, it's basically been, for the last few months, we've just been, every, it's just covering everyone. Yeah. And that's what the whole company is just running on is, yeah. and, it, and, it's, and it's hard and it's so heartbreaking to, I mean, we've moved our pastor operation from Tuesday to Saturday to Wednesday to Saturday just to not burn our staff out and, and kill them and, and we, we wouldn't have enough to operate on the Tuesday. But seeing all these restaurants, you know, in the time where, you know, we were lucky that we were open mm. throughout most of it, mm. but so many of these restaurants weren't open mm. and now they're closing because they don't have because staff. They have staff. Yeah. It's ridiculous. It's, it's so sad. Yeah. And I mean, a lot. I, I don't understand things like, there's all these people in Europe who can't come and work in an industry that they loved in a city they love mm. because they don't because they can't come in because of Brexit and like they need to have a hospitality waiver there needs something needs to be done because I don't know how this industry is going to be in in six months yeah um, and it can't just keep rolling as it is now yeah and we're, we're making so um, we've started an apprenticeship scheme which is like it's big for us as a company of our size mm. To you know, it's a lot of you know, as you know, it's a lot of like time and resource um, to put into people. You can't just we can't just bring them in and you know, it's like a, a you know a regular member of staff that you need to train. This is this is a young person's livelihood. Mm. Like you need to put everything into it, and like you need to make sure that they're being trained really well. And this is something like for our benefit, but I feel really strongly that a, a lot of people need to do it because how many years down the line? Like we need apprentices mm. learning now, so that the industry's in some sort of place in in a few years because sure. it's it's tough, and I worry that it's the industry's becoming harder to work in, mm. and people are going to leave. Yeah, I mean, it's exactly. yeah, so 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 tough. <laughs> it's so many different and, things, and obviously, I guess, <laughs> kind of difficult question to answer. But what do you see, kind of the outlook of the industry as in terms of that the workforce? Like personally, I see technology solving some of those issues yeah. with automation and even robotics, which are coming in in certain places of the world. Um, but do you see it becoming more attractive to people because of maybe higher salaries, or maybe it's better working conditions with the addition of technology? Um, or like, what's your kind of thoughts on the future? Is it positive or massive change or? Um, I mean, my, step, my, my worry, I guess, for the future is um, and I always, I've always talked about this and talked about it before COVID is I think firstly it stems from like a young age in our country of hospitality is never really talked about as an industry mm. of like if you go to France or Spain or Italy you know you've been you've probably been served by you know a waiter or a waitress who's 40, 50, 60 years old in, in England like probably unless you go to a Michelin style restaurant really fine dining restaurant you're going to be served by a younger person mm. and it's never you know when I went to school and I speak to a lot of friends who I went to uni with and just you know you go to those like career things career events and and not there's not even someone in the corner hidden of talking about hospitality mm. it's there's never it's never any there's no one ever talking about because it it's never seen as a good career it's like people probably just sit in this country as like you're a waiter you're a waitress you're a barista yeah. you know you're a chef and there's no you know people don't highlight the progression that you can have in the industry um <clears throat> you know if you're an operations manager of a restaurant group that's a cool job mm. that's a really exciting on your feet like people managing job like mm. can you not sell that to, to the young people of this country to want to come in and, and like work with amazing produce as a from early on in their career um so i I am slightly worried about it, I guess, because I don't see 
much like youth coming through and um, you know I think in the last year and a half, I think this last year and a half has probably stopped even more training because you know even just speaking to apprentices that we've been interviewing now they've been halted by a year and a half of not doing anything mm. and I'm sure there are a lot of people in that midst of it who have just given up on trying to train, train to be a chef or you know work in front of house mm. um, so I mean I, I think they need to, I think more people need to enter the market um, for there to be you know a lot of hope going forward mm. in, in terms of your automation stuff I'll be honest I don't know a lot of that side of of the industry I guess because we focus more on like the, um, I don't know if it's a highly skilled labor with like the pastries and pasta that we work with. Yep. I just see like a, there's way less quality in the industry at that level. And, mm. and it's, you know, it's gonna take, it's, it's a lot of training for people, people to get to that level. And um, yeah, I guess the automation side doesn't sort of. Sure, it's just like a different yeah. level. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I also see, I think the specialized sector, let's say yeah. it's more hands-on, highly skilled. I think that will remain and just will become a higher salaried position. Yeah. And hopefully it becomes even more cool and recognized as yeah. cool. Um, and then we do attract more people into that. Yeah. I think the borders, especially the UK, obviously is a big issue. We need to attract more international people coming through and facilitate them coming through. Yeah. Otherwise it's going to be very, very tough, I think. A hundred percent. Yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move on from yeah. that. So, um, so you mentioned the market, obviously it's busy now. It's a mm. little bit erratic, I suppose, still. Um, a little bit of what, sorry? Erratic, yeah. in terms of up and down. And yeah. I think different locations still around the country. Some are busier than others, obviously. Yeah. Weather um, hits us more than it used to hit us. Okay, which is interesting. Interesting. Yeah. interesting. Um, but how is the current market for you? And also, I guess, in addition to that, how do you see consumer habits changing coming out of COVID? So obviously working from home, mm. or maybe even the way they are purchasing food, um, and also kind of, yeah, just general trends um, in terms of interaction with food. Um, I mean, I think, so for, we've actually, and just, just on that, like with the recent, what was the recent changing of rules? I've forgotten all of them. There was one last week about, <laughs> Uh, oh, it was like Freedom Day, whatever that meant. Yes. Um, and people, I think, were more encouraged to go into offices because we, I, I talk about this because previously and for the last few months, we've been sort of steady, busy, you know, throughout the day. Um, and then last week, we suddenly were like, there were these huge, huge rushes in the morning and then we got really quiet. Um, and then the, we got a bit busier at lunch again and, and suddenly, I didn't really think about it, but I realised that people are obviously now going back to their offices a bit, and there's um, there's that you know the trend of the morning coffee to work, uh, and then you know if there's an office around us, they'll come to us for lunch. Um, but in terms of you know the trend of people, um, how they're purchasing, I think, and what's good for places like us is I think people are realising about their, they have realized about their local independence a lot more um and you know they're they're willing to support their their local mm. um which is obviously which is really important but also you know good for the industry um and i think it's a time that everyone to sort of like rally together um you know we're in this amazing area in east london where there's so many incredible bakeries around us um and i think you know if we all work together and carry on you know, serving people th throughout this period and, and um, you know, giving them still, like we, we focus with our staff so much on like making people happy right now. Like people have had a tough year and a half, you know, and it's, if we can be the people that, you know, gives that smile to people's faces still and like, it's, it's those little wins that people want in their life. Mm. And I think that's really important. Mm. Um, in terms of, I'd say I'm just thinking about our, our pasta restaurant. It was really, um, I don't know, interesting, nice. In the first few weeks when we opened, we saw a huge increase in our average spend. Um, and I think people, as I said before, people are just wanting to, to do more in their local. Um, mm. We've definitely quietened the, that crazy rush of all the restaurants opened has gone. We've, we've quietened down um, from that, which 
in a weird way we we need because I think we don't have the staff to carry on going at that rate yeah. so uh, not that it's great but it was yeah it, it's something that sort of we um yeah it was, it was good for us well. it worked yeah. out well for us yeah. in the end because I don't know how we would have carried on at that rate or sure. we wouldn't have sure um but yeah pe people I think you've got to look at the at the positive and and mm. that people have come out of this and and I think you know after them isolating for however long they they want to be with each other and they want to you know that personal interaction which is why everyone loves hospitality I think people are appreciating more because they didn't have it for before absolutely absolutely yeah. I think you've done incredibly well and grown actually during the pandemic which is phenomenal mm -hmm. in so many different ways um, but just surviving is, yeah. is credit I think so what does the future of Popham's hold? Like, do you have kind of an end goal or an ambition or kind of some kind of a growth strategy in mind or it's kind of one step at a time? Um, so definitely one step at a time and definitely um, always remind myself of like trying to be the best and not the biggest. Um, we do have plans to grow and we would probably want to open a site you know soonish but the thought of staffing it is just like whoa mm. let's not like my my fear is you know if we can open a site in six to eight months time and we're like oh my god we've got to recruit 10 12 staff and then just that you know the thought of just like recruiting people for the sake of it and having something that you know one site can take the whole company down mm. and like i feel really i don't want yeah, just for the sake of it, a third site um, and and risk, you know, that whole loss of what we've done in the last in the last four years. Mm. Um, we're in a position now with our production unit that we're we can grow and expand a little bit more. Um, it's allowed us to do more in our pasta restaurant as well, because the whole operation was running out of that same kitchen and space and fridge space was just coming, you know, it was getting crazy in there. Um, so having this whole space for the bakery, um, you know, allows the pasta kitchen to even develop and test and just more time for, um, you know, concept development. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of growth strategy, want to grow slowly. Um, yeah, don't, don't want to have too many sites, but it's, it's what's really nice now is, you know, um, how can we grow in terms of, you know, it doesn't just have to be pastry shop, pastry shop, pastry shop. Mm. Um, you know, if we can grow the, the lifestyle side of it, if we grow the pasta side of it, we've just started this uh, small plates menu in Islington that started off really well. Um, so, you know, it's just that whole residential community vibe that, um, yeah, we, we want to create and it's, it's can you do, replicate that somewhere? Um, so it's not rushing into anything. We've got lots of ideas of, of how we can grow in the next few years. And um, yeah, it's, it's sure. fun discussing that, but it's- um, Slow and steady. Definitely slow and steady. Yeah, I've seen yeah, people yeah. put on sites for the sake of it and it, it's, it pains me. Sure, sure, makes sense. Okay, final question. Yeah. Um, somebody with an idea to launch a restaurant with that, I guess, passion for food and mm. maybe business. What advice, given your journey now the last four yeah. or five years, uh, what advice would you give somebody? So one piece of advice that they're kind of at that early stage of launching. One piece of advice, and it's something that I, I actually cherish this from an old boss who told me this. He was like, Oli, just whatever, if you're doing, I think I was talking to him about I wanted to run my own business. He was like, whatever you do, just only employ people who are better than you. And that's really stuck with me. And that's how I feel Popham's is at now, mm. or, or what I've created at Popham, is that I've only hired people who are better than me. And mm. like on like a management level a bit, it's like you can learn off these people. And if you just give like these amazing people the, the, um, you know, the freedom to, within your parameters, the freedom to do what they want, then you know that's how your business is going to grow and grow successfully. Like it's, there are so many amazing people out there, and just let them bounce ideas off each other, and just let them, you know, take it in the direction they want. That dish, or you know, that pastry. Um, but yeah, just employ people that are better than you. They'll learn off each other. You'll learn off them, and you'll create an environment that you know you only want people to be positive and and, yeah. and grow in. Great advice. Really good advice. Yeah. I think that's going to be the title of this. I think it's it's all about the people. It's all about the people. <laughs> so, yeah. In every term. 
Great, good stuff. Well, massive pleasure speaking to you, Ollie. And uh, I think it's phenomenal what you've done to date. And I wish you the best of luck going forward. Well, no, thank yeah. you so much. And honestly, it was a, it was an honour when you sent me that email, and I saw the other names in the email. I was like, you must be joking. That's uh, you it. fit in perfectly. But thanks Great. so much. I really no appreciate your time. <laughs> no thank good you very stuff. much. Cheers.